Today the Hoya is sitting down with Father Kevin O'Brien, who's the Executive Director of Campus Ministry here for the main campus. This is part of the Hoya series on the faces and individuals behind the titles here at Georgetown University. And Father Kevin O'Brien is a 1988 graduate of the university before he went on to the University of Florida Law School in the hopes of pursuing a political career before a series of different life choices brought him to the priesthood and ultimately to the university. So thank you for joining us, Father O'Brien. Glad to be here. Thank you. So I guess the first question is, why Georgetown originally back in 1985 or 84? Yeah, I no, graduated from my high school in South Florida in 84. Uh, two reasons in particular. One, uh, I wanted to go to a Catholic university. And I had not really had experience with the Jesuits, but my, uh, but my guidance counselor in high school kept talking about Jesuit education. So she was a big advocate. Uh, and secondly, I wanted, I was interested in politics, and so I wanted to come to Georgetown to study government and, uh, and to be close to Washington, D.C. And then what were you involved in when you fresh, freshman arrived on campus? Mm -hmm. Uh, the first year, it got my bearings. Um, I remember, I, I believe I got, I did uh, community service shortly after, after I arrived. Mm -hmm. I tutored at a, a D.C. public school. Um, I got involved, at some point I started to write for the Hoya, uh, either my freshman or sophomore year. And then uh, after my freshman year, I got involved in student government and served on the board of directors of the Corp. Now, getting involved with student government, is that, did you think about politics in general then when you were yeah. thinking about student government well, here at Georgetown? Yeah, much like today, uh, where so many students are politically active mm -hmm. and sensitive, um, I certainly was interested in politics. So I remember interning, I were interned at a, at, a, at a presidential campaign, I interned at CNN, so I was doing stuff in the city, but also on campus, I hung around some people who were active in student government. And then you made the decision ultimately to attend law school back home right. in Florida. So my, uh, you know, my senior year, I really felt this desire to, to, to really get involved in politics and public service in that way. And, uh, and so I went, uh, I went back home in order to start you know, networking and building that career from the ground up. And, I went to the University of Florida Law School, which was sort of an incubator of future politicians in the state. And so I went, I went there, and, uh, uh, and really that was my focus for going to law school. You said just there that you knew where you were going when you were in law school, but clearly where you thought you were going then isn't ultimately where you found yourself. So where did, right. where did those things begin to change since well, you were so sure in law school? There often comes a point you're in your 20s where you ask questions like, who am I, what do I stand for ultimately, what are my most deeply held values, who is my God, what role should my faith have in my life, or does it have in my life. Um, so I guess in my mid-20s a bunch of things happened where, I, I, after law school I went to work at a private law firm, I was a corporate litigator. and. Uh, uh, again, getting well connected into a community, getting known, making connections. But I was a corporate litigator. I didn't enjoy the work. The work was uh, tough. You know, I learned a lot, but it was it, it was tough work, long hours. Um, now, at this point, was there a nagging feeling in the back of your head that maybe this isn't right? Yeah, I think so. It was. At different times during during that stretch when I was practicing law for a couple years, it would come back to me saying, like, "Is this?" Do I want to give my life to this? And even to politics, I was getting a little disillusioned. At the time, I was serving on the board of my the high school I went to back in West Palm Beach where I was practicing law. And that was a Jesuit high school, correct? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it wasn't. No, it was a, just a Catholic high school. Catholic. And, uh, and I was serving on the board of that high school. And uh, the principal came up to me after a board meeting. Uh, and she was one of my teachers when I was in high school. And asked me and said to me, you know, you, I think you'd be a great teacher. Have you ever thought about teaching? Would you want to come and teach here? And, you know, my initial response was, oh, you know, I have a life of land. <laughs> right. And I, you know, I had been practicing law for about two years. I had this career going. And so I politely said no, but her invitation kept nagging at me. So I kept saying to myself, why? why? That idea of teaching was very intriguing. Mm -hmm. I tutored in college. I 
then did done some TAing in law school, and it was really intriguing. So then you, so then you taught for more than your sabbatical. <laughs> so right. you made a commitment to. Wait, so I taught for three years. You taught for three years, and what happened after the three years of teaching? Well, it was during my three years of teaching where the vocation to the priesthood came alive in a way it never had. I, you know, it, it's, it was much easier to be sensitive to that kind of vocation teaching in a Catholic high school than in a law firm. <laughs> I just had more time, and, and, and I was doing work which was a little, a little more uh, congruent with those kind of thoughts, a religious, religious life. So uh, it was really teaching, uh, again, talking to people more intentionally, you know, praying every day, uh, teaching, coaching, leading retreats, being in that environment which really made this calling to the priesthood ever more clear. And a final question. Earlier, before you joined the Jesuits officially, you mentioned that there was something in you that was restless, um, mm. the Magis. Is there, is that still in you today? Is there oh, yeah. That, well, no, there I think... Kind of break free? Yeah, no, I think, I, I think, yeah, God, a, a healthy restlessness is a good thing. A restlessness that, that doesn't allow a person to commit is not a good thing. And I used to be like that, you know, to, to jump from one thing to another, where you just, I was spreading myself so thin and not going deep enough. That's not the magis. The magis is this restlessness, this desire for something more or greater. It's a, a desire for something greater than yourself that will bring depth to your life and will contribute something to the world. But I think this restlessness can just be a wonderful source of energy, of passion, of commitment. And so, yeah, do I feel restless? Um, yeah, I try to tap into that. Because if I don't, I, I might get too complacent, a little too laid back. And again, this is not a call to workaholism or perfectionism, which I and so many students here suffer from. Mm -hmm. That's, this is not what it's about. Or Sean Sartorius. <laughs> it's not what it's about, you know, because there is a time and a place for leisure, for relaxation. Self-care is so important. But a healthy type of restlessness can just be very important to, to move us to wherever God wants us to move. And again, it doesn't mean you move geographically or change jobs. It just could be a greater commitment to the work we're doing now, a creativity that had not been unleashed before, to do things, do the same things differently. Or it could be a greater commitment to the people in your life. So I think that's what the the magis, the more, the greater is all about. Well, Father O'Brien, Executive Director of Mission and Ministry here at Georgetown, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, appreciate it.